Say with me, Father, I receive your word. I embrace it now. Beyond my mental understanding. But I embrace it by faith. I receive revelation. Teach me. Show me the way. Through your word. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, give God praise for the word. So how are our levels online? Are levels online okay? Okay. Make sure our online folk are receiving a good experience. I'll get a couple of ushers to help me with this board. Isaiah 43, verse 18 says, Remember ye not the former things, neither consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing, and now it shall spring forth. Shall ye not know it? I will even make a way in the wilderness and a river in the desert. Can we see this in the Amplified, please? It says, Do not earnestly remember the former things, neither consider the things of old. Behold, I am doing a new thing. Everybody say new beginnings. New beginnings. He says, Now it springs forth. So there's no waiting as far as God is concerned. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive? And know it, and will you not give heed to it? He's talking about recognizing what God is doing when he's doing it. He says, I will even make a way in the wilderness. That's like a highway through a forest. Okay. He says, and I will even create a river in the desert. What is he saying? By whatever means necessary, there will be no natural circumstance that will stand in the way of what I'm prepared to do in your life. Okay? Amen. Isn't that good news? Well, let's celebrate. <laughs> I'm going I'm to be on y'all today about celebrating. You got, uh, don't get, don't get so, uh, so used to the word that you don't celebrate the word. Well, celebrating it is part of receiving revelation from it. Okay? And then... Uh, verse 20 in the Amplified, it says, oh, did I do that already? Yeah, I did. Okay, Revelations 21.5. Revelations 21.5. He that sat up on the throne, he who is seated on the throne said, See, I make all things new. I make all things new. Also, he said, record this, for these sayings are faithful, meaning they're accurate, they're incorruptible, and they're trustworthy, and they are true, or they are genuine. God is speaking a word of new beginnings. He is speaking a word of new beginnings. Now, it doesn't matter where you are in your life. It doesn't matter what you've done, what you haven't done. Doesn't matter what you feel or assess your capabilities uh, 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 are. God is saying, I am now prepared to do a new thing in your life. I am going to do something new in your life. Something new is exciting. Something new is really exciting. Especially when you don't know exactly what it is. Just because it's new, it's exciting. How many of you are ready for something new? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some of you didn't even raise your hand. But if I ask you how many of you want a new car, everybody would have raised their hand. But you see, but, but again, it's akin to revelation. It's akin to revelation, so uh, it's all right. You'll raise your hand later when it's revealed to you. For God to say, I want to do something new. Just want to do something new. 
something new for you. Aren't you tired of the old? Aren't you bored with the old? What's wrong with something new? Is the father saying, I just want to give you something new. And I want to help you receive that. Something new of God. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, please. If you're driving a 1975 vehicle and it's 2018, you're driving that 75 vehicle not because you can't get a more updated one. You're driving it because you want to drive it. And you either want to drive it because it's a classic and it's been restored and made new. Or you want to drive it because you don't want to go through the process of something new. You have become very comfortable with the old. Okay? You've become very accustomed to the old. Somebody during that time has probably offered you a better car. And you turned it down. Now nah, I'm happy with my old jalopy or whatever name you give it. You see, there's an attitude that has to come with the new things that God will bring into your life. And it's an attitude of embrace. It's an attitude of no fear. Sometimes people hang on to the old because they fear not being adequate enough to handle the new. But you got to lose those attitudes that will forfeit the new things of God away and out of your life. And the Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians 5.17 that when a man comes into Christ, everything changes. Everything changes. And I'm going to say to you that if you came into Christ and everything didn't change, it's because there was a problem in the system of your being that would not allow the new beginning to take root and to grow in you. But when a man or woman comes into Christ, everything changes. We know this to be true. All we got to do is look at the documentation in scripture. Every time Jesus came in contact with anybody, everything changed in their life. Everything changed in their life. They could no longer live life the same. They could no longer proceed as usual and under the normal circumstance. It changed everything turn their life right side up. If any man be in Christ, if is the operative word. Because just because you sit up in church don't mean the if is in your favor. Just because you walk down the aisle and pray the prayer doesn't mean the if is in your favor. If any man be in Christ, there is no way he's going to stay the same. Everything changes. Come on, let's celebrate Jesus. Celebrate the anointing. Everything changes. The Amplified says it this way. Something occurs when you come into Christ. There is an engraftedness that occurs. If any man is engrafted, plugged into Christ. He becomes a new creation, a new creation, a new creature all together. And that transformation does not happen on the outside first. That transformation happens on the inside first. And when it happens on the inside first, there's no church, there's no religion that have to make you do anything. You do it because your nature is being transformed. 
not simply because your behavior is being modified. Okay? I'm changed from the inside out because Christ now is in me. The word Christ, as I've been saying to you, is not Jesus' last name. It's Jesus the Christ or Jesus the anointing or Jesus the anointed one. And when that anointing lands in your life, everything changes. Say everything changes. Say the new beginning has begun. All right, back to the King James translation, verse 17. It says, any man being Christ, he is a new creature. And what are the implications of this? All old things or what? And all things what? See, the problem is, is that if you buy into the idea, now that I'm in Christ, I, 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 I got to stop sinning. That's not what that's talking about. Now, now that I'm in Christ, I, I don't want to get caught in the club. That's, that's not what it's talking about. See, the anointing works from the inside out. What the anointing does, it deals first. It does surgery on the heart. It does surgery on the heart. God knows I, I, the behavior. I'm not thinking about that. I'm not concerned about the behavior. This man just received me, just embraced the fullness of my anointing in his life. So the behavior must change, not because he's going to change it, but because the anointing is going to change it from the inside out. And so God is not intimidated by your, your behavior. He's not intimidated by your sin. He has more confidence in his anointing to change your behavior and to change your sin than to be intimidated by it. So you never have to run away from the Father when you do something wrong. You run to the Father when you do something wrong because it's the anointing you want to get close to that's going to transform you from the inside out. The first level of this new beginning begins with an embrace of the anointing. Christ. Embracing that and receiving that. That's when old things passed away. Not that's, that mean that, 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 that old things physically, old things naturally. It means old things from the root level, old things, starting with this. See, this right here is the reason why a lot of Christians don't see nothing different. This right here is the reason why a lot of Christians don't feel like everything has changed and cannot appreciate the idea of a new beginning in Christ because they look around through this and they see everything the same. They look around, they look at themselves through this and feel everything the same. Well, I still have the same thoughts. I still have the same desires. I still like the same crazy stuff. See, you think you do, but you don't. But you think you do. And the reason you think you do, because you walked up here and prayed the prayer with the pastor, but you never got in here. See? You never got in here. Or you go to a church where they make you feel good and sing your favorite song, and the preacher sweat and spit all over the place, but he don't teach you this. He don't teach you this. See? This cannot change until this is taught. Because this is the only thing that has the power to renew the mind. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. And all things are passed away and everything changes. Come on, let's give God praise for the word. 
Praise for the word. Everything changes. All right, so... In Matthew chapter 9, verse 16, in the King James translation, let's look at this. Matthew 9 and verse 16. It says, no man puts a piece of new cloth on an old garment, like for a patch. Anybody remember patches? Come on, let me see who, who, who grew up getting stuff patched. All right, yeah. They buy patches today. They buy their clothes with patches on it today. It's the style today. But no man takes a new piece of clothes and put on old garment. Why? For that which is put in to fill it up takes from the garment and rent and the rent is made worse. Oh, okay, so that's King James, Old Elizabethan English. Let's go to NIV. Let's look at it in the NIV, see if we can get some, some understanding here. No one sews a patch on, of unshrunk, unshrunk, that's new material, unshrunk cloth on an old garment. For the patch will pull away from the garment once it shrinks. And when that happens, it makes the tear worse. Okay? Let's look at it in the Amplified. No one puts a piece of cloth that has been shrunk, that has not been shrunk, on an old garment, for such a patch tears away from the garment, and a worse rent or worse tear is made. Now, let's look at verse 17 in the King James. Verse 17 in King James, it says, Neither do men put new wine into old bottles. Else the bottles break, and the wine runs out, and the bottles perish. But they put new wine in new bottles, and both are preserved. Now, bottles back then weren't, weren't, wasn't, it wasn't glass and plastic. It was, it was, it was animal skin. All right, so let's look at that in NIV. Neither do people pour new wine into old wine skins, because if they do, the skins will burst. Why will the skins burst? Because they, the old skins will be agitated by the fresh fermentation of the wine, okay? So it will not be able to hold. So if they do, the skins will burst, the wine will run out, and the wine skins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wine skins, and both are preserved. Amplified, please. Neither is new wine put into old wine skins, for if it is, the skins burst and are torn in pieces, and the wine is spilled, and the skins are ruined. But new wine is put into fresh wine skins, so both are preserved. What God is trying to get to you, he's got to first pour through you. And if he's trying to facilitate a new beginning through an old wineskin, you will not get to your destiny. Because there will be a disruption of your design and of your purpose and of God's plan for your life. So that's what I'm saying. You have to shift and you have to reset. You have to reformat your mind and your thinking. You got to stop this old, this old religious safety net mindset. that won't allow you to receive the word of God in the name of, well, I, I don't, I'm not used to that kind of church. Well, I don't, I just, I just wish they would do this more or that more. You don't need that. 
You don't need your, your mama's church. You need new wineskin to hold the thing that God is doing through you. He's doing a new thing through you. And you can't keep doing the same old thing and expect God's new thing to follow through. Matthew 6, 33. You have to turn your thinking in the direction of your new beginning. Say this with me. I must turn my thinking in the direction of my new beginning. So you got to do it. And what is that going to do to you? Well, you're going to probably be a little bit uncomfortable because you're no longer in your zones of comfort. It will probably create a little uneasiness in you because now you don't know everything. <laughs> and you can't predict the next move. God is now truly driving. And you are now truly a passenger. Okay? And so, we have been trained to function backwards. We have been trained to figure it out first and do it. And God says, God's way of doing it is like this. No, I figured it out already. And I just simply tell you what to do. And you do it. And three years later, you figure it out. I'm telling you, that's the way it is. That's, that's the way it is with God. You, you're not going to figure it out. It's going to come to you like, oh, that's what he was doing. That's what God was doing. Man. <laughs> it, is, it is the best way to live. It's the best way to live. It's called faith. It's called living by faith. Like, mm, I don't want to let go. I don't want to let go. What, what if this? What if that? What if this? So Matthew 6.33, look what it says. It says, let's put this back in the right order. First, seek the kingdom of God. What is that? His will, his plans, and his purposes for your life. Then, all the things you're trying to figure out, they're going to be added to your life. The stuff that you're trying to do to preserve what you're calling your life will work out for you and will all come together in the end. God says, I want you to stop trying to run this ship. I want you to stop trying to figure out what you need to do. All I need you to do is understand I've got it all figured out. Say, God has it all figured out. Come on, say it again. God has it all figured out. Jeremiah 29, uh, 11 in the Message Bible. Jeremiah 29, 11 in the Message Bible. Look what God says. I know what I'm doing. That's what he says. I know what I'm doing. I have it all planned out. Plans to take care of you. Not to abandon you. Plans to give you the future that you hope for. Seek first my kingdom 
and all these things will be stop trying to go after these things without my kingdom plan for your life and those of you that have figured out the kingdom plan for your life that you've sought out God's will you know his will for your life don't abandon the ship stay on the course of God's design for your life and your future will work out just fine amen, amen. praise the Lord no, let me, um, <laughs> over in Africa, when I say amen, amen, when I say praise the praise the Lord, so I'm just kind of used to that, you know, so I'm trying to teach y'all, all right, no, anyway, uh, look at verse 34, Matthew 6, verse 34. I think that's right. Matthew 6, 34. No. Uh, okay, it says, take no thought, therefore, for tomorrow. For tomorrow will take care. No, tomorrow shall take, wait. Take, therefore, no thought for, give me the New King James Version. <laughs> <laughs> Matthew 6, 34. All right, the New King James says, therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. And verse, uh, um, uh, verse 25 also, verse 25. Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life. So he said, don't worry about tomorrow. He says, don't worry about your life. In terms of what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, what you're going to wear, who's going to pay the, the mortgage, who's going to buy the, all the, the, uh, the stuff, who's going to pay for tuition, the insurance. Don't be worried about all that. Don't be worried about all that. My retirement, don't, don't worry about it. It's what you put on. It says life is more than provision-based need. Life is more. He's talking about the quality of life is far greater than you worrying and toiling and striving for basic needs. You're going to miss life if you live that way. He says life is greater. There's more to life than that. There's a better way of living than that. Okay? That's what he's saying. Well, bills got to be paid. Isn't that what we say? Isn't that what you, that's what you want to ask, that's what you want to say to God right now. That's what you want to say. Yeah, but Lord, the bill's got to be paid. If I don't worry about it, who's going to worry about it? Okay, let, let's, let's look at that. Go to 1 Peter 5 and verse 7. Cast your care on him. Why? Because he cares for you. I, I demonstrate this. Isn't it me? Oh, let me take care of it. Oh, I, I care for you. Oh, I care for you. Yeah, yeah. I care for you. That's, that's not what that means. That's not what that means. That means care means worry. Care means stress. Care means anxiety. Care means the burden of weight. Go to Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, please, in the King James. Philippians 4 and 6 in the King James. He says, be careful for nothing. That's the care we're talking about. Be careful. The word careful is a compound word. Two words, one care, one full. He says, do not be full of care for nothing. Careful don't mean safe. When people tell you, buy now, be careful. That, that, that's wrong. They're telling you, be full of care. <laughs> be full of stress. That's wrong. They should say, be safe. 
so he says, be careful for nothing. You want to, I want to say, the Bible said don't be careful for nothing, but you know, you can't do that. But see, he, he says, do not be full of care, but in everything, do what? Pray. What does that mean? Decree the word. That's what it means. Prayer is the management and administration of the word. Prayer is not a complaint session with God. Prayer is not therapy from God. Prayer is the administration and management of his word. He says, tell me what I said. I don't want to hear what you think. I want to hear what I said because my word has already settled everything. So when you come to me, come boldly before my throne of grace that you may find help in time of trouble. But don't come complaining. Don't come crying and whining. Come and tell me my word. He said, come boldly. Come in here with my word so that I can act, make me mindful of the things that I've declared to you. Decree a thing and it shall be established unto you. Death and life is in the power of your tongue. Speak life. Speak the word of God. So you're not praying unless you're talking word. You talk word. That's prayer. Lord, I'm so worried about it all. And I, Lord, don't let that happen to her. And, and Lord, and, and, and don't let her have a heart attack either. And Lord, and, and keep this. Girl, I pray for you all night. You killed her. That's what you did. You killed her all night. Because you did not speak the word over her. God says, no, it's already written. I don't need you to make up no words. All that stuff, all these flowery words, oh, Father, thou art most high, God, all the, come. That ain't, no. He says, I've already written. All the prayers are written. All the prayers are written. All you need to do is go to the Word. 1 John 5, 14, please. All you need to do is go to the Word and get the Word. That's prayer. He says in 1 John 5, 14, and this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we pray, that word ask is pray in the Greek. If we ask anything according to what? According to what? One more time. Not my will. Not my idea. Not my thought. Not my concerns. Not my emotions. His will. If I pray according to his will, God does what? He's not hearing that other stuff. He's hearing what he said. He's hearing what he said. <laughs> now see, you know, you're not supposed to get mad right now. You're supposed to get glad. You're just supposed to just like, oh, God, I thank God I know the truth now. That's what you're supposed to get. Some of you all swole up looking at me all funny. And the next verse, next verse, look at the next verse. And if we know that he hears us on the basis of knowing that he hears us because we're speaking his word back to him, then whatever we ask, whatever we pray, we know we have the petitions that we desired of him. Give the Lord praise. <laughs> Hallelujah. So... 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 5. So I don't care. I don't care because he does. No need in both of us caring. Because if I care, he's not going to care. Because God's not going to spend his time caring if you're going to do it. So when a thought of care comes to you, what do you do? Because all it is is an imagination. All it is is an imagination. What is an imagination? It is a production of your personal thought. That's all it is. So he says, cast down your personal thought production that does not match what I said. <laughs> if I didn't say it and you thinking it, you imagining things. And you need to cast that down. 
And how are you going to cast that down with what I said? Because it will exalt itself in opposition to the knowledge of God. It will serve as an antichrist, anti-anointing. And it will bring, and then therefore, when you cast it down, you bring every thought that is out of line into the obedience or in compliance with the anointing. Christ, with what the anointing is capable of doing. This keep you healthy. This keep your mind clear. This, this keep you full of joy. This keep you happy. Whatever you want, this keep you. So, no, in this new beginning, there's no care. It's carefree. Because God is orchestrating it, and God is administrating it. He's just doing it through you. It's a new beginning. It's a new beginning. And it's carefree. So what I got to do is turn my thinking in the direction of my new beginning. What does that mean? Whatever God is speaking to your heart, turn your world in the direction of his words, the words that he's speaking. I know this is important over here. I know you got stuff going on over here, and you got all this. You're looking at all this. He's, but he's saying you will calibrate all of this stuff by turning your mind in a direction of, of what I'm speaking to you right now. Because because what I'm saying to you right now is inclusive of taking care of all the stuff you think so important you got to handle. He said, I'm trying to consolidate things for you. And I'm trying to simplify your living so you can experience some joy and some happiness and some peace. So that's why he will speak a word to you to organize you, to organize your thoughts, to organize your attitude, your mentality, so that you don't have to try to do all this and all that and I'm not doing that. No, he says, no, I'm saying something. I'm speaking something. If you take that, what I'm saying, if you take what I'm speaking, it'll produce the outcomes that you're trying to manage on your own. And it's carefree. Let's look at another example and we'll, and we'll close here. Now, I'm not fixing to close, but this is my last biblical reference in terms of an example. I may use another scripture. Never mind. Just go to Luke 5. Luke 5, 1. And it came to pass, and so I'm just going to read, so let's just, just, just roll with me here for a second. So it came to pass that as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Genesaret. And he saw two ships standing by the lake, but the fishermen were gone because they were washing their nets. He entered into one of those ships, which was Simon's, and he prayed. See that word prayed? That word is ask. He asked Peter, can you just thrust this ship out a little bit from the land? so I can sit on it and use the water as an, as an acoustics so that people won't be crowding around me while I'm trying to speak to everybody. And I can just speak to them just off the shore and everybody can hear me. And now when he had left speaking, well, when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, wow, okay. Simon, Peter, what you got going today? Uh, nothing. Let's go fishing. And get your nets ready for a draw. A draw means a large increase. A large increase. A big catch. And here's Simon Peter answering Jesus. Now Peter has no idea that he's, in, he's on the threshold of a new beginning. 
He has no idea that his life is getting ready to change forever from this day forward. Okay? See, and so this is why I'm saying that we have to be in a place to where we are sensitive to God's word that he's speaking so that we don't miss the moment that he's trying to get something to us, but he's got to get it through us. And Peter's mind is being conflicted right here in this exchange because Peter's mind is not accustomed to functioning and operating at the pace Jesus is introducing him into, into. So he answered and said, Master, he recognizes him as teacher, Jesus. He, know, he knows who Jesus is. He says, now we've toiled all night. Underline the word toil. Because you see, prior to your new beginning, what you toiled at, you will do with great ease after your new beginning. He says, we've toiled all night and we have taken nothing. Here's how I define toil. Working harder than necessary for the same results. Working harder than necessary for the same results. He says, but you know, you said it. And only because you, if you were somebody else, I'm going to tell you right now. There's no way I refit this ship to go back out into the sea after coming home, not catching anything, cleaning my nets, and cleaning my ship. You're the only person, I'm going to tell you right now, you're the only person I'll do this for. So because you said it, I'm going to let down the net. Notice Jesus said nets. He said net. So he didn't go all the way. Next verse. There's some repercussions for that. And when they had done this, when they had obeyed, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes, and that net broke. One translation says the net was on the verge of breaking. Either way, it was insufficient to embrace the influx of this new beginning. Why? Because Peter was trying to put new wine in an old wine skin. Okay? When God speaks to you, you must change, turn your mind in the direction of the new beginning so that you don't come up short and trying to embrace it. Next verse. And when, and when they beckoned uh, unto their partners, the other business partners he had, he says, y'all got to come out here and get some of this. And they, the other ships came out that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both the ships so that they what? Began to sink. How many of you are ready to begin to sink? Like, fill me up. Load me up. Next verse. When Peter saw it, okay, now, here we go. Here we go. Some of the things you're praying for, you're not even ready for. You know why? Because your mind hadn't been turned in the direction of your new beginning. So Peter saw it. He fell on his knees, and here's what he said. Depart from me. What does that mean? Get off my ship. Okay? Why did he want Jesus off his ship? It says it here. Because what? Come on. I'm a sinful man. Oh, Lord. Stop right there. Now, those words came out of a heart that was not ready to embrace a new beginning because what the new beginning brought what your new beginning will bring into your life, you won't deserve it. You won't deserve it. And if you don't turn your mind in the direction of your new beginning, you'll be telling Jesus, get off my ship. I don't need this. This is too much. I can't handle this. I don't want, no, no, this is too much. And God is like, too much? 
but I'm trying to get something through you. It's not all for you, but I'm just trying to get it through you. I'm trying to make you an extension of me. I need you to be a center of distribution for those that will come around you. He fell on his face. He says, get off my ship. Can't handle this. New beginning. Can't handle this. Why? Because in his heart, he, what his mind, he saw that abundance. He saw that favor. He saw that increase. And his mind went back, man, all the people I cheated. I jacked my price for fish up so high. I, I, I know I, I don't deserve this. And what Jesus was saying to him was, you will never deserve it. So it's not about you. You're looking at this and you think this is about you. This is not about you. This is about humanity. Here's what God is saying. I've reached you. Now I'm trying to reach the world through you. Get you out of your way. Next verse. He was astonished. And all that were with them were astonished at the large fish, of the large catch, the drought, the drought of the fishes which they had taken. Verse 10. And so was also James and John, the sons of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon. And Jesus said unto Simon, Fear not, because from this day forward, you shall catch men. So one of the things that you need is to turn your mind in the direction of your new beginning. And part of that process is called the embrace of righteousness. The embrace of righteousness. Righteousness is a manda it's mandatory that you have a righteousness mindset because you can't go with God without that. Because if you try to go with God without a righteous mindset, then you will trip up when his goodness comes on you. Okay? You will trip up when his goodness comes on you. So what righteousness does, and we're talking about God's right, not your righteousness, it keeps you in tune to God's favor. It keeps you in tune to God's favor. Only righteousness can embrace the gift of new beginnings. You go from earning to receiving. God grants you favor. He grants you the blessing. He grants you honor. He just puts honor on you. You don't deserve it. And if anybody know you don't deserve it, you know you don't deserve it. Right? And your mama know you don't deserve it. Okay? She look at you like the Lord good to you, huh? Because mama know everything. Okay. Mama know what daddy don't know. So you don't deserve it. Get over it. Get over it. Get over it. Righteousness keeps you in tune to God's heart and God's plan for your life. Now my last scripture is Mark 10, 28. Then Peter began to say unto him, Man, we left everything to follow you. We gave up everything. We did it. We did it. <laughs> Next verse. Jesus said, hold up. Don't get it twisted. 
Okay? He says, nobody has given up everything without receiving more. No man has given up his house, his family, his mother, you know, all that, wife, children. And what he's talking about, not forsaken or not, not walking away from these things, he's saying, but not making them primary anymore. Making the kingdom primary, the kingdom first, the kingdom in me first. Because I can't be husband to wife without kingdom in me first. I can't be father to son without the kingdom in me first. I can't be son to mother, father without the kingdom. They don't want the other version of me. Okay? They want the version of me where kingdom is first. All right? He says, but nobody, don't talk to me about that, because nobody has given up all this and has made the gospel or the kingdom priority without verse, about thir verse 30, but shall receive a hundredfold. Now, in this time of the same that they've given up, houses, Brethren, sisters, mothers, children, lands, with persecution, and in the world to come, eternal life. In other words, he says, Peter, you're talking to me about all you gave up. Because you know, honestly, Peter, you know, was well off. He owned real estate, according to this. And not only him, but some of the others, according to this. He said, but none of you have left any business any land, and you've not put me first above any of these things without receiving a hundred times more than anything you've put second to me. What's he saying? Before you talk to me about what you gave up, let's have a discussion about what you've gained. Tell me now how much better life is. Tell me now how much better you sleep. Tell me how it feels to have a job and keep one. Tell me what that feeling's like being a father to your children a mother to your children. Yeah. Your new beginning is waiting on you.